favorite uh, pieces of art. Uh, it's from a, uh, an artist, Solomon Wolfing, from Germany. And what she's showing here, of course, is a lizard curled around the entire frame. And superimposed on the lizard's lateral eye is a human that's asleep. And the eye of the lizard is superimposed on the head of this sleeping or unconscious human being. And then above, you see a human being who's completely awake and filled with illumination. So I, I love this image because it gives a nod to very accurate neuroanatomy, which Solomon Wolfing couldn't have known about. She did this in the 1915 era. But inwardly, intuitively, she sensed this interrelationship between an ancient vertebrate eye in the lizard superimposed with a higher sense organ, perhaps, in the human being. And finally, taken from the pages of psychology today, here's a depiction of the human brain and an eye smack dab in the center. And all of you know that that eye is located in the diencephalon exactly where we'd find the human pineal gland. I don't know whether the artist knew that when he drew this, he or she drew this picture, but I find it an interesting depiction. So there's a rich history of art, literature, religion, uh, spiritual traditions. Uh, that acknowledge a third eye function, perhaps, uh, but not an anatomical one. Well, where, where does this function potentially exist in the human nervous system? This is the kind of slide I show to my students day in, day out here at the medical center. We just dispense with that whole third eye stuff. We, we, for some reason, modern medical education doesn't want to entertain that idea yet. Anyway, here's the human uh, brain. It's a wonderful organ. All of you sitting here have one, uh, and I'm sure it's entirely normal. Uh, so coming down here would be the spinal cord, the brain stem. Here is the corpus callosum. And here, this region right here is called the diencephalon in general. And there are two players in the diencephalon. Right there is the human pineal gland. You'll notice it's roughly in the center of the nervous system. It's midline. It's exactly midline. It's unpaired like most things in the brain. Also, uh, the pituitary gland would be found right here. In this specimen, it's been pulled off because it's often pulled off in dissection when these things are removed from the calvarium. Uh, but these are both components of the diencephalon, hypothalamus, thalamus, pineal, and pituitary gland. That shows you roughly the same area, the anatomical area of those organs. And I'm going to talk a lot about the pineal gland. And in fact, now I'm going to switch back into the scientific mode and just say that uh, everyone here knows, I know you know this, uh, you know it experientially, you learned it in, in, uh, in uh, high school, perhaps in college. Light is a force, a physical force that allows us to see the world. Pretty obvious stuff allows us to ambulate, sit and watch slides, do our work, enjoy our friends and our family, and so forth. We're a highly visual species. Our two eyes are very evident on our face. And without that sensory system, it's considered a, a serious handicap. You can live without them, but it's a problem. So we're a highly visual species. I'm not going to talk about vision today in that sense. Our eyes actually have two completely independent sense organs housed within them. And this is a very new and exciting scientific discovery that's only been made in the past seven to eight years. So it's really brand new knowledge. I'm going to talk about that newly discovered sensory system in much of this talk. Not only the basics of it, but what we can potentially do with it and where it might lead us. So this is a rough outline of what I'm talking about. Here is the eye, light out there in the environment comes into your eye, it goes through the cornea, the lens, the vitreous humor, and goes back here to the retina. And the retina converts signals of light and sends them to the thalamus and then the visual cortex back to the back of your brain. And that's what allows you to see the world. But there's a second pathway, completely independent, that goes to a non-visual part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, labeled here SCN. That works as an inner clock mechanism. It's an oscillator. And it oscillates at approximately 24 hours a day. So it allows your body to have a timing of physiology to the, the world of light and darkness out here. And that little nucleus sends information broadly through the nervous system to all the major control centers that regulates biological time and responsiveness of humans to light and darkness. 
So signals are sent to other portions of the diencephalon, to the limbic system, down to the midbrain, all the way down to the spinal cord. And that neuroanatomy is very well established. That's concrete, hardwired, well-known, well-published stuff. Now, this diagram is taken from a great uh, medical journal called the New York Times. Uh, I've modified it for accuracy, but it's been borrowed. And what you see here is a cutaway of the human nervous system, light coming in the eye from the environment, signals going to the retina, signals then going to the thalamus and the visual cortex back here, allowing us to see the world. What's shown is a multisynaptic indirect pathway of getting light to the pineal gland. So, retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that little clock mechanism here in the hypothalamus. Right below that clock is the pituitary gland right there. And then there's a short nerve projection to another nucleus in the hypothalamus called the paraventricular nucleus. A long descending nerve bundle goes down to the spinal cord, to the upper thoracic spinal cord, out of the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion, and then back up into the cranium to innervate the pineal gland. So if you're not an enthusiast of human neuroanatomy, let me just say it this way. Light gets into the eye and a bunch of signals are sent through the nervous system and it eventually gets to the pineal gland. Um, so even though that gland is in the center of the brain, light and darkness is sent into it by way of nerves. And so it is able to control its 24-hour biochemical synthesis of a family of compounds called indolamines one of which I'm going to talk about a lot, and it's this indolamine here, melatonin. And I know, as you look at this picture, you say, oh, melatonin, yeah, that's a 5-methoxy indole, right? Everybody knows that. Um, actually, in 2003, more melatonin was taken in the United States than vitamin C, which I find is a truly astonishing fact. So people have heard of this compound. Here is its chemical structure. It's synthesized by the pineal gland. Again, that's a hard, hard and concrete fact. A little bit about that, though. Melatonin is synthesized and released into the bloodstream in a rhythmic pattern. Let's look just at the top frame here. This is the human being. During the daytime, the hatch bar shows you nighttime. The clear area shows you daytime. During the daytime, the pineal gland is relatively quiet and not producing much of this hormone. If I had a nurse come in the audience right now and remove a blood sample from your arm, we wouldn't detect much or any hormone in it, right? Any pineal hormone, melatonin. However, if I do that same thing an hour or two after the dinner tonight, we would find that there would be an increased synthesis and secretion, and that would be very high throughout the nighttime and maintained in the following day during daylight, it would crash down. And that's the normal, typical human melatonin uh, synthesis pattern that probably all of you have. It's not unique to our species. If we look at a bird, the same thing is true. Low during the day, high at night. We can look at a goldfish, low production of melatonin from its pineal gland, high during the night. You can look at an insect species, a moth, low production of melatonin during the day, high at night. Even, ladies and gentlemen, Ganeolex pellegra, a single cell phytoplankton, a single cell that's abundant in the oceans, low production of melatonin during the day, high production during the night. Now, two things. First of all, Ganeos pellegra is one cell big. It doesn't have an eye, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have a pineal gland. And yet it produces melatonin in the same day-night rhythm that a very complex species such as our own and these other complex species does. So nature has preserved the chemical identity of melatonin across all these diverse species and its physiological connection to light and darkness in the environment, whether the species has an eye or does not have an eye in the way we think of eyes traditionally. 